Okay. Hi everyone again. I'm Ming Hang, the delegate of Vietnam. And uh, firstly, uh, thank you for Mr. Chung Yutak and Ms. Uh, Sunipon for your informative and interesting speech. And uh, I believe that um, this topic is highly beneficial to all the delegates of uh, 14 uh, countries from the ASEAN Blue Tree. Um, uh, you know, now today, we have to trade a lot of things to have the economic growth. Uh, and as consequently, we are encountering various pro problems um, due to the unsustainable development such as global warming, climate change, uh, zero pollution, especially in uh, big cities. And um, uh, I also suppose that the youth will play an important role in applying the uh, sufficient, uh, sufficiency economy philosoph um, philosophy to their, uh, to their life, to their family, to their community, and especially to their country. And, uh, uh, I have a small question for Ms. Uh, Sunipon. Uh, you know, uh, when you mention about the uh, philosophy sufficiency economy uh, is world built um, is will be well I mean it will be built and uh, totally depends based on the status of Thailand economy and so how we can apply this uh, philosophy to other country while there are a lot of discrepancy between Thailand and other country and uh, can you specify the role of the youth leadership in uh, applying this uh, to their nation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments and also thank you for your questions. Definitely sufficiency economy as I already, I think I, uh, I've already talked about this, that this philosophy was created based on His Majesty the King's initiatives and it is designed to be applied to all of the sectors. If you um, pay attention to my slides, um, not just only the farmers, small farmers in agricultural sectors can apply, but also in business sectors and also um, individuals just like you, youth just like you. If you apply, you know, um, the three principles and also the two conditions in your own everyday life. Remember, moderation, reasonableness, risk management, and also knowledge and moral principle in your everyday life. As a youth, you can go along with your successful everyday life. And then when you go to work in any sectors, definitely, it can also be applied in your work as well. And as I already mentioned, that not just only the economy based on economy, but also in other areas as well. So I hope that um, when you go back to your country, to your countries, I'm sorry, 14 countries as youth, we depend on you because you are our future. I hope that by applying sufficiency economy um, to your everyday life and also to your work, it can create a healthy, sustainable world in the future. Thank you. Cảm ơn you, Minh Hang, for your question, and thank you, Dr. Suliparn. Uh, we would now like to call upon our second reactor from Indonesia, Mr. Ramli. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the change. Okay, I'm Ramli, I'm from Indonesia, and great presentation from Dr. Suliparn. I make a uh, note from your presentation. Sufficient economy is a philosophy based on the fundamental principle of Thai culture. This concept is focused on empowerment of marginal society in Thailand. Uh, with one of the goals is this economic philosophy create a balanced and sustainable economic development as well as to witness the face of any change that occur. I'm sure I believe that the sufficiency, the sufficient economy philosophy when we implement in ASEAN country will be, it will be increase the wealth, the prosperity 
of the citizen as well as to against the poverty and support the sustainable development goals. But I see the lack, the limitation of this concept. The first, the, ph the philosophy is not consistent with the reality. Today, we enter the new era, ASEAN economic community, with, which is the uh, intensity of the movement of the gods of the uh, surface will be yeah will be spirit movement. Okay, I'm nervous. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And the second main part of the world, such as Jakarta or Bangkok, Singapore, still enjoy with the capitalism. So my question is. How does the sufficient economy face this fact? How to make the, this philosophy uh, be a sustainable economic system? Thank you. Thank you very much. You think that's a good question? I think that's a very good question. Why? Because I've been asked this question so many times. As I already talked, that the term itself Sufficiency. You remember, I talked about this. Sufficiency is not attractive. Let alone, you know, the term itself. It's not, it's not representing something prosperous, something developing, something growing. Sufficiency is like um, um, getting our butter tight, right? Moving backward, right? So, I'm going to say this one more time, that His Majesty the King is not building, is not creating this philosophy for Thai people to move backward. But again, I have to say this again, that His Majesty the King created this philosophy for the Thai people to be wealthy and prosperous on the strong foundation. Like, you know, when you build a house, Oh, all right, when you build a building, when you build a building, like two-story building, you need a pile, foundation, right? Go deep into the ground for the house to stay strong, right? Do you think that by building the two-story building compared to the 10-story building, do you think that the same foundation is going to be used? No, right? So in order to create, you know, prosperity in order to create wealth bit by bit higher and higher up you need a very strong foundation otherwise our economy our country is going to collapse like last time that we experienced in 1997 economic crisis because it's based on the bubble that's why they call it a bubble economy because it's so shallow because it's so unsustainable and then when the bubble it's expanding, expanding, this is going to blow up anyway, right? So that is why we have to, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be, I, I don't want to say it's going to be difficult, but definitely it's, it's not going to be easy. Sustainable development concept itself is not going to be easy to achieve, right? Because when you need to be sustainable, you need three pillars, environment, people, and economy. In order to balance the three pillars, it's going to be difficult. But because of our hands that we work together, and also the great things about this is understanding. If you understand the concept of sufficient economy, and you understand the concept of sustainable development, and you apply it, it's not going to be that difficult. But it's up to you as you use. You have to you know, expand the understanding into other and into other sectors as well. Right. I hope that that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ramley, and thank you, Dr. Siliporn. And now we would like to call upon our last reactor uh, for Dr. Siliporn. Uh, so we would like to invite Mr. Alejario from Timor Leste. Well, thank you for the time and uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to know His Majesty Wum people. Uh, my question is uh, how the Majesty combine uh, 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 the first question is it in Thailand have a parliament 
parliament in Thailand. So how the king and the parliament combine the uh, policy to become a reality is the first point. And the second point is uh, for Mr. Chung Utak. Well, we say glo global village. It's a policy. Uh, I don't know the policy of uh, global village that achieve uh, uh, that UN achieve today. So thank you. But what, uh, I, I don't know uh, what have been achieved in policy, especially in a global uh, citizenship. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for your question. This is an interesting question again, because we have been ruled, I mean, this country, been ruled by absolute monarchy for a long time. As I already said, that is king's number nine, right? And the, um, the, our system has changed from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy, when it was king number seven, right? So that is why we still have parliament under responsibility of the prime minister. But the king is under the constitution, right? The king normally don't, doesn't have any responsibility or roles or, you know, JD job description for the king to do anything. But this king has already mentioned that he's quite special, that he wanted to do something great for the country. That is why he developed his own royal development projects one by one. Why did I say out of his own pocket? Because he doesn't have any job description, so no one really even expect him to do anything, right? But as he already did, the government decided to support what he does. So I, I told you that the government decided to create the um, Royal Development Projects Board under responsibility of government to take care of the um, Royal Development Projects. So that's a relationship of, you know, the, His Majesty the King's work and also the support from the government. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for your question. The policy uh, of global science of education in UN and UNESCO. This is a new and emerging issue. Uh, still, we are searching. Uh, we, we, we would like to set up the policies uh, in UNESCO in Paris. Uh, very much focus on, we call it PVEE, -E, Prevention of Violent Extremism Education. Because last year in Paris, in in, in the world, there are a lot of uh, uh, what the terrorism. That's why the uh, U.S. and uh, West European countries support prevention on violent extremism education. So UNESCO uh, started to develop curriculum, guideline, manual for. Uh, National uh, Educa Ministry of Education. So this is uh, one policy by the uh, UNESCO. The second is uh, my center, UNESCO APSEU, uh, UNESCO Cadet to Center. We very much focus on uh, developments of uh, curriculum on global citizens of education. And we already select uh, several countries to develop the national curriculum and textbook or those teaching material uh, on global citizens education. So this is a long-term project, not only this year or uh, next year. This is a 15-year project. So we will develop uh, all those uh, curriculum develop. Uh, all we will implement curriculum development and teacher training, and also the youth leader workshop like this. Uh, this is. Uh, 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 it is uh, it's the beginning uh, of all those policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chimwata. <laughs> and thank you, Alex. <laughs> uh, so for our next three reactors, just so we can speed things up a bit, we'll collect the questions first. 
and that will let uh, Dr. Tungadak uh, Utak address them. Uh, so if we could please get the question from our first reactor for this section, who is uh, Ms. from the Philippines, Mr. Yuriel? Yuri. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Utak, for your very informative talk. Uh, I feel that your topic of global citizenship and international understanding is extremely important on a number of levels. Firstly, because you remind us that the international community works towards the common goals of peace and sustainable development. And secondly, because the attainment of these goals not only benefits individual countries, but the world as a whole. I was particularly struck by the portion of the talk when you discussed global citizenship education. You talked about how important it is that we each imbibe a sense of belonging to the global community, and you stressed the need for us to have a healthier appreciation of and respect for cultural diversity. Uh, I strongly believe that it is precisely the sort of attitude of recognizing that we belong to a shared community with shared objectives and values that will allow us to collectively foster peace and harmony in our world. However, we know from our individual experiences in our respective countries that we are educated to uphold the values of nationalism and patriotism and to work towards the promotion of our country's national interest. Unfortunately, there are times when this national interest will conflict with the interests of the broader international community. So my question is, how do we uphold this notion of global citizenship while still maintaining some semblance of nationalism? How do we reconcile these two seemingly contradictory concepts? Uh, uh, my name is uh, half a Filipino name, you know. Otak, what's the meaning? Brain. Yeah, brain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Very, very uh, what critical question. Uh, we are living in, uh, in, in the national boundary in the today, the nationalism. You know? Nationalism, as you know well, that started uh, almost two centuries or three centuries ago. You know? Today, nobody deny we are living in, uh, in a, within the, the national boundary. Uh, we are Filipino, we are the Thai, I'm the Korean, and the Chinese, and uh, Japanese. When I was young, 1960s, I nev uh, we never expect to travel like this. Uh, yesterday, I went to the Grand Palace. I was very, very surprised. Uh, almost 10 years ago, Grand Palace, uh, not very crowded like this. But today, in the Grand Palace, so many tourists, so world is changing now. You know? We are travel like this. So uh, we, we maybe uh, as a leader of uh, uh, your country, your uh, Southeast Asia, you will be uh, not only the a Filipino. You know, you will be the uh, ASEAN identity. You will have uh, ASEAN identity and global citizen identity. So we will live in that such a global community. We have to have a several identity. Filipino, ASEAN, and global citizenship, global citizen identity. That's why I insist we have to have a multi-identity coming 21st century, multi-identity. Before, I was only Korean, but uh, I raised and I have experienced in UNESCO. Uh, and now I have half, uh, Asia, half Southeast Asia because my name is uh, the <laughs> Bahasa Indonesia in Tagalog. It is, uh, the meaning is very, uh, the brain, very easy to remember, attack. Yes. So I like Thai food and uh, pad Thai, uh, Khao Pad and Khao Nia Mang Luang. Yeah. Without Thai food, I, I, really, yeah, I miss so much. So we are living in such a uh, very, very small world. We have to have a multi-identity. So we will, how can I say, uh, escape from such a parochialism and nationalism. If uh, uh, for the future, for your success in your life, you have to have a, such a, a strong uh, multi-identity. That, that is my advice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we would like to call upon our second reactor, Mr. Moma Genichiro from Japan. 
Uh, I'm Genshin Momo from Japan. Uh, first, thank you for your great presentations. Uh, this is the first time for me to listen to the presentations from the people from UNESCO. And it was really innovative for me. Yeah. Uh, last year, I worked at a uh, consulting venture business in Boston as an internship student. The office of the uh, company is located in the campus of the university, and many teachers and students work there in order to, uh, in order to practice their researches uh, in the real world. Compared to that, I feel uh, most universities in Asian countries doesn't have such roles, and I think these universities should have more impact on the real society and this uh, global world. Uh, so my question is, what do you think is the role, or what do you think should be the role of the university, Asian universities in the theme of leadership? OK, thank you very much. Uh, your name is Ichiro. Gen Genichiro, so Genichiro, yeah. yeah, please call me Gen. Yeah, <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. So uh, last two months, I traveled to Japan uh, first uh, two times. Uh, once I traveled to Osaka, Nara, and Kyoto. The second time, I traveled all Jushu from the Fuku Fukuoka to Kagoshima. Uh, I like Japan very much. Uh, because uh, I can read kanji, Chinese character. And I studied during my university Japanese language. And Japan is uh, uh, very clean, very kind, and very systematic. On time, uh, all those trains arrive on time. So I don't have any problem travel to Japan. But uh, also, it, uh, my feeling was very uh, complex. Uh, uh, what, how can I say that? complicated by the history of uh, Japan and Korea. As you know well, in Kyushu, uh, there are a lot of uh, historical sites the, in, in, in Kyushu. And also the uh, Nara uh, in, in, uh, in ancient history, the, the relationship between Japan and Korea. So uh, I, I had a very complex feeling uh, in, in Japan. So maybe you could not understand well, I, I'm not sure, in Southeast Asia, if you travel to Thai people to travel to Myanmar or the uh, Cambodia, maybe you can have uh, uh, such uh, uh, feelings. Uh, I believe uh, the university is very important to reconcile the, this uh, what feelings and history. Uh, a uh, university uh, should play a leading role to what make uh, all those uh, uh, the students as as uh, the to understand uh, those uh, history and uh, what the to make them as a one. Uh, finally, I told you, uh, human beings uh, came from the uh, one person, one one human. Uh, homo sapiens, so we are family. So we have to teach such a concept to the uh, students. The, the leading role of a university uh, should be a global citizens of education. During my trip to the Japan, I went to the uh, APU, Asia Pacific University in Beppu. Then university uh, recruit students from Asian countries. They are living in one campus. They understand well different cultures. So this is very good uh, uh, example uh, of the uh, role of university in 21st century. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Gang, for your question. And thank you, Dr. chung Duck, for your reply. And now I would like to call upon our last reactor, Ms. Danielle Kang from the Philippines. Hello. There you go. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Utak, for your very educational um, speech. I particularly, particularly appreciate how the emphasis on education as the main proponent on how we can encourage people or show them how we are all part of one global society. But I think 
that also poses some issues because there are many parts of society that don't have access to good education or quality education. So while we are all fortunate enough to have access to education and that we are all very aware of the concept of global identity, there are a lot of people in our society that don't grasp this concept as well. Um, to them, it would be a very abstract concept because they themselves can't fully appreciate the benefits of being part of a global society when they too are encountering other issues that would be at the forefront such as poverty and um, lack of access to education and health facilities. So my question is what are concrete steps that we can take beyond traditional education to promote the importance of global citizenship and how can we help help them realize the sense of global citizenship despite the various barriers that are existent. Thank you. Oh, very, very difficult uh, question. I don't have an answer, you know. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer, you know. Uh, access, this is uh, very important. In, in EFA, the uh, uh, Education for All focus on access on to education. Uh, still in the world, there are a lot of countries, a uh, lot of uh, children, they cannot attend the school. We have to improve all those conditions. The Philippines, I traveled so, so many times to the uh, Philippines. I still remember that Nabotas near uh, Manila. Uh, I don't know the number of pe people here. 200,000 people live in uh, Nabotas. Uh, very few schools, uh, the, the, there's no access to the uh, basic education. So we have to improve the basic education. So uh, unfortunately, UNESCO only advise to the National uh, uh, Ministry of Education. Uh, it, the, uh, the, your own country, your, your government has um, uh, main uh, responsibility to increase access. So uh, in the sense, the UN and UNESCO, UN adopted uh, MDG and now SDG. We have to improve universal primary education. We encourage member states. You have to have uh, more money for education. So UN, UNESCO encourage. In the national budget, you have to provide uh, more, more, more than 20% of your national budget to education. That is UN UNESCO's recommendation. So uh, UN uh, government is uh, what the main uh, responsibility, your main body for the improving the access. Uh, this is, a, how can I say, vicious circle to push government to have uh, more money for education. You have to have uh, uh, what the, uh, the, the such a power. Having such a power, you have to be educated. So this is a vicious circle. I don't know the answer. But I know only one. Education is key for national development and peace. So without education, you cannot develop your country and you cannot uh, guarantee uh, the security or the peace in your country. So uh, this is my on uh, comments on your uh, question. And for the global citizenship education, this is more, how can I say it, more luxurious uh, the terminology theme for those uh, uh, very poor uh, LDCs, least developed countries. But with global citizenship education, the main, main concept is a sense of belonging on, on global uh, community. With this global citizenship, we can share our money or the, our uh, expertise with uh, least developed countries. That's why I believe global citizens education is a uh, uh, basic philosophy for uh, ODA, official development assistance. So this is my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, uh, Danielle's question ties into the UN Sustainable Development Goal number four, which is uh, ensuring education access for all. So we're going to have a look at that 
uh, during our second workshop this afternoon. So we'll be able to dig deeper into, into the questions and issues and what can be done. So it's great that we've kind of opened up to that topic. Um, uh, but now I would like to thank our participants, and, oh, sorry, and our speakers. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Momra Chawangrajia Apakon, uh, Director of Simeo Spafa, to present the tokens of appreciation to our distinguished speakers.